safe food state. Internecine struggle, as well as the hatred of the local population for the Turkmen rulers, was used by the Ardabil Sheks, the feudal lords of the Safavids, whose influence in northeastern Azerbaijan began to grow from the beginning of the 15th century. The Safavids got their name from their founder, Sheikh Sefiyeddin, 1254-1334, who headed the Sufi Dervish order in Ardabil, called Sefwai, after his name. Sheikh Sefiyeddin himself was apparently a Sunni Shafiite, but his descendants subsequently adopted Shiism, which at that time was widespread among the people. Shiism is one of the two main theological branches of Islam, Sunnism, and Shiism. The main formal disagreement between Sunnis and Shiites boils down to the fact that the Sunnis do not recognize the principle of heredity of the caliphate, the caliph is the spiritual and secular head of the Islamic, Muslim community. They recognize as legitimate heirs to the power of Muhammad the first three caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar and Osman, who were not family members or descendants of the Prophet, and do not recognize the exclusive rights to the caliphate of the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet, Ali, his sons Hassan and Hossein and their descendants, Shiite Imams. The Shiites, on the contrary, consider Abu Bakr, Omar and Osman to be usurpers and recognize only Ali and his descendants as the legitimate heirs of Muhammad. The name Shiism comes from the Arabic word Shu'a, which in translation into Russian means a party, a sect meaning a party, a sect of Ali's adherents. In the early years of Islam, after the death of Muhammad, a fierce struggle for power took place between the adherents of Ali and their opponents, which ended in victory for the latter. Ali and his son Hossein were killed. It is believed that only after the death of Hossein did Shiism take shape as a special religious party and theological persuasion. As a movement opposed to orthodox Sunnism, Shiism began to spread rapidly in Iran, conquered by the Arabs in the 7th century. In essence, it then became an ideological form in which the protest of the population of conquered Iran manifested itself against foreign invaders. In the future, Iran was repeatedly subjected to the conquests of the Sunnis, Mahmud Ghaznavid, Afghans, etc. These conquests and the struggle of the conquered peoples against the conquerors, as a rule, took the form of a religious struggle between Sunnis and Shiites. Therefore, the ideas of Shiism, opposing the Sunnis, served as an ideological, religious banner of the struggle against foreign conquerors, feudal lords and feudal states, headed by Sunni dynasties. Academician V. V. Bartold noted that Shiite movements in Iran were predominantly popular movements and often took on an agrarian character. In this regard, Shiism was popular among the masses of Iran. The Safavids joined Shiism, seeking to use its popularity to strengthen their influence. And since the main Shiite dogma said that only the descendants of Muhammad and Ali can be spiritual and secular leaders of the Muslim community. Then among the followers of the Safavids back in the 14th century, there was a legend that the Safavids were descendants of the 7th Shiite Imam Musa Qasim, who in turn was a descendant of Ali. In the second half of the 15th century, the Safavids were already so strong that they began a struggle for power in Azerbaijan with the Turkmen dynasties. The Safavids were supported by small and medium-sized feudal lords, dissatisfied with the power of the Turkmen nomadic nobility, and also partially by the merchants who were interested in eliminating continuous civil strife and in uniting Iran. At an early stage of its development, the Safavid movement apparently enjoyed the support of the broad masses of the people. In terms of its composition and goals, the Safavid movement was not popular, but in their struggle against the Turkmen dynasties. The Safavids tried to use the discontent of the peasants and artisans. The Safavids also relied on the Turkic nomadic tribes of Ustalu, Rumlu, Shamlu, Tekel, Bahalu, Zulkadar, Ofshoz, Kajaz and the Varsak tribe. The father of the first Safavid Shah Ismail introduced for his adherents, the Turkic tribes, the obligatory wearing of a turban with red stripes, therefore these tribes were also called Kaiselbash, i.e. red-headed. The state subsequently founded by the Safavids was also often called Kizilbash. In 1499, the young son of the Safavid Sheikh Haydar Ismail became the head of the Kizilbash. Using the internecine struggle of his opponents, he first defeated the Shavansha Farukhaisar, an old enemy of the Safavids, 
and an ally of Ake Koyunlu, and then during 1501-1502. Defeated the squads and Sultan Alvand Ake Koyunlu himself. In 1502, he captured all of South Azerbaijan and occupied the city of Tabriz. Having occupied Tabriz, Ismail declared himself the Shah of Iran, 1502-1524, Tabriz his capital, and Shiism, the state religion of Iran. In 1502, Ismail also defeated Sultan Murad and captured central and western Iran. The state of Ak Koyunlu thus ceased to exist. After that, Ismail began to subjugate the rest of Iran. Moving east, he ran into the head of the Uzbek tribes, Mohammed Shibani, who, after the death of Sultan Hossein, captured part of Khorasan in 1507. Detachments of Uzbeks were defeated in 1510 by Shah Ismail near Merv, and Shibani himself was killed. The defeat of the Uzbeks was of great importance for establishing the power of the Safavids in the east. The whole of Khorasan and territories up to the Amu Doria River were captured by Ismail. It should be noted that only since the 16th century Khorasan, a very significant part of the population, of which are Tajiks, and which had previously been organically connected with Central Asia for many centuries, was cut off from the Central Asian regions and formerly included in Iran. At the same time, Ismail spread his conquests to the west. By 1507, the Safavids captured Armenia and Kurdistan, in 1508 they captured Baghdad and Arab Iraq. The movement to the west brought Ismail into conflict with the Turks, who also sought, especially under Sultan Selim I, to push their borders to the east and laid claim to Transcaucasia, Kurdistan and Arab Iraq. The wars between the Safavids and the Turks started badly for the Safavids. In 1514, in the battle on the Chaldaran Plain, the Turkish troops of Selim I, who had artillery, which Ismail did not have, inflicted a decisive defeat on the Kizilbash and occupied Tabriz. True, the lack of food and the unrest that began among the Janissaries forced the Turks to clear Azerbaijan soon, but the wars between Turkey and Iran did not stop after that. They continued intermittently for more than a hundred years, until 1639. The Iranian-Turkish wars took place under the banner of a religious struggle between Shiites and Sunnis. But in fact, these wars were fought for the possession of Arab Iraq, Kurdistan, and mainly for the possession of Transcaucasia, rich in raw materials and minerals. As well as for establishing control over the most important trade routes between Europe and Asia, passing through the territory of Azerbaijan and Transcaucasia. In 1519, the Safavids captured Georgia, after which the Shervan and other Transcaucasian Khanates were subordinated to them. Thus, under the first Safavid Shah Ismail, a huge state was created. Many Iranian and Western European bourgeois historians consider Ismail and his successors to be the creators of the Iranian national state, which allegedly took shape in the struggle against the Turkic conquerors. But it wasn't. In fact, the Turkic, Azerbaijani tribes of the Kizilbash, who constituted the main military force of Ismail, took an active part in the creation of the Safavid state. The dominant stratum in the Safavid state, especially at first, was the nobility of these Turkic tribes. Commanders and governors of regions were appointed from its midst. The palace guards of the so-called Kerches were made up of the sons of the nobility of the Kizilbash tribes. Although the official correspondence was conducted in Persian, the Azari language dominated at the court of the Safavids and in their troops. Shah Ismail himself wrote poems in this language under the pseudonym Katai. The Safavid state consisted of regions and countries inhabited by various Iranian, Turkic, Arab and other peoples and tribes who spoke different languages, were economically separated from each other, had their own special customs, moors, etc. Even the capital of the state until the middle of the 16th century was not in central Iran, but in Azerbaijan, in Tabriz. Azerbaijani tribes played a leading role in this state. Thus, initially the Safavid state was essentially an Azerbaijani state. It was only from the time of Shah Abbas, I that Iranian elements, including the Persians, began to occupy a more prominent position in the Safavid state. Although the Safavid period of the history of Iran is still very little studied, nevertheless, based on the available data. 
It can be argued that the Safavid state under the first Safavids was not an Iranian national state at all, but a conglomeration of various peoples and tribes created as a result of conquest. Ismail and his successors saw religion as the most important means for uniting their diverse state. That is why, as mentioned above, already in 1502 Ismail officially declared Shiism the state religion of Iran and encouraged its spread in every possible way, persecuting the Sunnis. Ismail was considered not only a secular ruler, but also a religious head. Given the popularity that Shiism then enjoyed among the population of Iran, as well as the low level of socio-political development of the country. It must be assumed that Shiism in those conditions really served as a very serious means of uniting the country. During the first half of the reign of the second Safavid Shah, Tarmas by 1524-1576, wars continued between Iran and Turkey. Turkish troops during this time repeatedly invaded the possessions of the Safavids, 1532-1533, 1534, 1548, 1553. In 1534, the troops of the Turkish Sultan Suleiman I occupied Azerbaijan with Tabriz, as well as Baghdad. They soon had to leave Azerbaijan, but Arab Iraq remained in their hands. The danger of Turkish invasions, as well as the fear of the inhabitants of Tabriz, who hated the unpopular and stingy Tarmasp I, forced him around 1548 to transfer his capital from Tabriz to Kazvin. This was preceded in 1547 by a great uprising against the Safavids in Azerbaijan. Iran's wars with Turkey were temporarily stopped by a peace treaty concluded in 1555, according to which Iran retained all the territories seized in Transcaucasia, Azerbaijan. Armenia and eastern Georgia, according to this agreement, Sultan Turkey and Shah Iran, which tormented Georgia, divided it among themselves. The Treaty of 1555 formalized the capture by Iran of Samsha, Kartli and Kakisha, and by Turkey Imerisha, Guria, Abkhazia and the land of the Laz. By the end of the reign of Tarmasp I, the internal situation in the Safavid state became more complicated. Significantly increased taxes by Tarmasp I ruined the peasantry. In the east, Khorasan was subjected to systematic attacks by the Uzbek Khans. In 1571 plague and famine struck the country. In different regions of Iran, popular uprisings took place against the power of the Safavids. The most significant of these were the uprisings of peasants and urban poor in Jalan, 1571, and the uprising of artisans and urban poor in Tabriz, 1573. After the death of Shah Tarmasp I, 1576, Internecine strife began in Iran among various groups of the KYZYL Bash nobility, who put forward their pretenders to the Shah's throne. Shah Ismail II, who was enthroned in 1576, whom his father, Shah Tarmasp, had previously kept in the Katka fortress for 20 years, was poisoned in 1578. He was replaced by another son of Tarmasp a weak-willed, Sikh Mohammed, nicknamed, Kudaband, God's servant who occupied the Shah's throne from 1578 to 1587. The Turks took advantage of internal unrest in Iran. In 1578, the Turkish Sultan Murad III began a war against Iran that lasted more than 10 years. Turkish troops, to whose side some of the Azerbaijani feudal lords, dissatisfied with the Safavids, went over, captured the whole of Azerbaijan with Tabriz, as well as the western regions of Iran. During the Iranian-Turkish War, the Uzbek Khan Abdullah II again invaded Khorasan and occupied Herat, Mashhad, Nishapur and other cities. Perplexity and confusion reigned in the court circles of Iran. Under these conditions, in 1587, one of the groups of the KYZYL Bash nobility, headed by Khans, leaders of the Shamlu and Ustalu tribes, Abbas, born in 1571. The young son of Shah Mohammed Kudaband, was declared the Shah of Iran, who had previously been listed as the governor of Khorasan. Under Abbas I, 1587-1629, who entered the history of Iran under the name Shah Abbas the Great, Safavid Iran reached its greatest strength and power. During his reign, Iran not only conquered the lands seized in the west by the Turks, but also annexed new territories, Afghanistan and others. In the first years of his reign, 
Abbas, I was busy in the east fighting the Uzbek Khans and suppressing frequent internal uprisings in Jalan and other provinces. Subjugating the northern Caspian regions of Iran, Abbas I turned them into Hossi, his own possessions, Jalan in 1592, Mazandaran in 1596. Wars with the Uzbeks and the suppression of internal uprisings forced him to conclude in 1590 the Constantinople peace with the Turks, which was difficult for Iran. According to which Iran ceded to Turkey all of Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan with the city of Tabriz, except for Ardabil and Talish, and a significant part of Luristan. Abbas I used the respite in the wars with the Turks to fight against the Uzbek Khans in the east and to carry out internal reforms. In 1597, the troops of Abbas I in the Battle of Herat utterly defeated the detachments of the Uzbek Khan, who fled after the Amu Doria. The whole of Khorasan and the region of Herat were subject to Abbas I. Subsequently, Abbas I occupied Kandahar and reached Bork. To protect the borders of Khorasan from possible future attacks by the Uzbek Khans, on the orders of Abbas I, about 15,000 Kurds were resettled in Bojnard. Having consolidated his position in the east, Shah Abbas I began to prepare for a war with Turkey, undertaking a reorganization of the army for this. This reorganization was carried out under the leadership of the commander-in-chief of the Shah, the talented military leader Alaverdi Khan, Armenian by origin. The English adventurers, the brothers Antony and Robert Shirley, also took part in this business, who, accompanied by numerous companions, arrived in Iran in 1598 and entered the service of the Shah. Regular troops were created as part of a 12,000-strong corps of riflemen, two fengchi, and a 10,000-strong corps of cavalry at Gulams. Gulams were recruited like the Janissary units in Turkey, the children of Georgians and other Caucasian peoples were selected as minors from their parents, converted to Islam and brought up in Iran. Tufengchi were recruited from the Iranian population. Artillery was introduced into the army. In opposition to the Kaiselbash tribes, Shah Abbas I created a special military organization that played the role of the Shah's guard and was called Shah Savans loving the Shah. People from all tribes could join the ranks of Shah Savans, but in fact the majority of Shahsavans were from Turkic Kaiselbash tribes. The Shahsavans, who soon turned into a privileged group, enjoyed the special patronage of Abbas I. They were granted large land holdings in Azerbaijan, between Tabriz and Ardabil and on Mugan, as well as in the Sava region, south of Kazvin. Shah Abbas I carried out his military reform not only to strengthen the military power of the army, but also in order to strengthen the central government. He sought to undermine the importance of the detachments of the Kizilbash tribes, which previously constituted the main military force of the Safavids. And by that time had become a source of unrest and unrest. Internal strife among the Kizilbash tribes, which were more subordinate to their leaders than to the Shah, and the claims of the nobility of these tribes to a leading role in the state. To raise their protégés to the throne, etc., caused a lot of trouble for the Shahs and led to a weakening of the central power of the Safavids. According to contemporaries, Shah Abbas I reduced the size of the Kaiselbash cavalry detachments to 30,000 people, while earlier their number reached 60 to 80,000 people. In total, under Abbas I, there were about 120,000 soldiers in various military units, together with service personnel, the size of the army reached 200 to 300,000 people. Having created a regular army and an organization of Shah Savans, Shah Abbas I significantly weakened the influence of the Kizilbash nobility and strengthened the central government. Under Abbas I, the importance of Iranian elements in the state apparatus also increased markedly, which gradually began to push aside the Turkic nobility, which still retained very important positions, especially in the troops. In 1597-98, Shah Abbas I moved his capital from Kazvin to Isfahan, located in the center of the main Persian regions. The transfer of the capital to Isfahan also testified to the growing importance of Iranian elements and regions in the Safavid state. Shah Abbas I also carried out diplomatic preparations for a war with Turkey. To conclude an alliance against the Turks, Shah Abbas I sent an embassy to Russia and Western European countries, headed by Antony Shirley, who visited Moscow. 
the court of the German emperor, and Rome. In 1603, taking advantage of the difficult domestic political situation in Turkey, which was weakened by civil strife and Jalali uprisings, Abbas I began a war against the Turks. Within a few years, Iranian troops occupied Azerbaijan, Armenia, eastern Georgia, Kurdistan, Luristan, as well as Baghdad, Mosul and Diyarbakir. Sacred for the Shiites, Karbala and Najaf also fell into the hands of Iran. After long negotiations, in 1613 a peace was concluded in Istanbul, according to which Iran retained all its conquests. The Turks tried to win back what they had lost, and already in 1616 the Iranian-Turkish war resumed. But the attacks on Tabriz, 1616, and Baghdad, 1623, were repulsed, and the terms of the Istanbul peace remained unchanged. Having seized Transcaucasia in the very first years of the war with Turkey, Shah Abbas, I was not sure that he could keep these territories under his rule. The population of Transcaucasia offered stubborn resistance to the Iranian invaders. Therefore, in order to break this resistance, and so that the Turkish army could not find food and fodder here in the future, Shah Abbas I decided to devastate the areas north of the Arak River. The inhabitants of these regions were either exterminated or forcibly moved to Karadag and regions of Iran. This resettlement was the greatest national disaster, especially for the Armenians. Most of the Armenian peasants were resettled in Mazandaran, which was the personal possession of Shah Abbas I. In total, about 30,000 families of Armenians and Georgians were resettled in Mazandaran by Shah Abbas I. The settlers, not accustomed to the damp Mazandaran climate, found themselves in a very difficult situation. It is believed that after 50 years of the settlers in Mazandaran, barely 5 to 6,000 people survived. About 5,000 families of Armenian artisans and merchants from the city of Jolfa, which was the main exchange for silk trade with Europe, were resettled in Isfahan. The resettled Armenians settled on the outskirts of Isfahan, where, thus, a special Armenian suburb arose, New Jolfa. By resettling the Armenians in Isfahan, Shah Abbas I sought to provide his capital with skilled Armenian artisans, as well as to move the silk trade caravan routes in the interests of the Shah's treasury. According to his plan, silk was to be sent to Europe not through the old Jolfa and Turkey, as it had been until now, but through Isfahan and the Persian Gulf, by sea around Africa. The silk trade was of great importance for Iran at that time. Silk was the main item of Iranian export. Olearius, who visited Iran in 1636 to 1638, reports that from 10 to 20,000 bales of silk were collected annually in Iran, each bale weighed about 216 pounds. No more than 1,000 bales remained in Iran, the rest of the silk was exported to India, Turkey and Europe. In addition to silk, Iran exported brocade, velvet and other fabrics, carpets, Morocco and other leather products, wool, tobacco, dried fruits and other goods. Europeans brought tin, copper, English, French and Dutch cloth, sugar to Iran. Isfahan has always had a large number of foreign merchants. Among them were Indians, Keresmians, Chinese, Bukharans, Turks, Russians, British, Dutch, French, Italians and Spaniards, as well as Armenians, Georgians and Jews. Income from the silk trade constituted the Shah's monopoly, but this trade was carried out mainly by Armenian merchants, who were the Shah's contractors, and enjoyed his special patronage. The Armenians had the right to single out from their midst a Kalanta, who served as an intermediary between the Shah's authorities and the Armenian community, and managed the internal affairs of the Armenians. They freely practiced their religion and enjoyed other privileges. In order to ensure his dominance in the Persian Gulf, and open the way for silk trade through this gulf. Shah Abbas I undertook the expulsion of the Portuguese from the island of Hormuz in the Strait of Hormuz, the Bahrain Islands were conquered by Shah Abbas I back in 1601-1602. The island of Hormuz and the port of Hormuz, located on this island, were of great commercial and strategic importance. Hormuz was a transshipment, intermediate point of the sea trade route between Europe and India. In 1507, seeking to establish their control over maritime trade with India, the Portuguese, 
under the command of Alfonso de Albuquerque, captured the island of Ormuz, but was soon forced to leave it. In 1515, Alfonso de Albuquerque, who by that time had already been appointed viceroy of the Portuguese possessions in India, arrived at Hormuz with a large fleet and captured both this and other islands of the Persian Gulf. The Portuguese built a first-class fortress on the island of Hormuz that has survived to this day and founded a trading post. For a whole century, Hormuz was the main center of trade in the Persian Gulf between Iran, Turkey, India and Arabia, not to mention its importance for Indo-European trade. By the beginning of the 17th century, especially after the defeat of the Spanish Armada by the British in 1588, the Portuguese began to gradually lose their positions on the outskirts of India. At the same time, other colonizers, the British, appeared off the coast of the Persian Gulf. In 1620, an English squadron defeated the Portuguese at Jask. This was preparation for an attack directly on Ormuz. In this struggle for Hormuz, the interests of Shah Abbas I and the British coincided. Exporting silk through Hormuz would have given the Shah a higher profit than exporting it through Turkey, which levied heavy duties. For the English East India Company, buying silk in Iran itself was almost two times cheaper than in the main silk trading center in Turkey in Aleppo. Iran at that time was of interest to the British both from the point of view of securing on the outskirts of India and from the point of view of the silk trade. That is why an alliance between Shah Abbas I and the English East India Company in the fight against the Portuguese was possible. In 1623, with the participation of the English fleet, the troops of Shah Abbas I captured Hormuz and the island of Keshem. The Portuguese retreated to Moscat, from where they continued to threaten Hormuz, repeatedly trying to recapture it. Since the Iranians did not have their own fleet to protect Hormuz, Abbas I transferred customs and all trade operations from the island of Hormuz to the coast of the mainland, where he was transferred to Gombrun and the port, called Bender Abbas Port of Abbas. The English East India Company, under the pretext of helping in the capture of Hormuz, obtained a number of privileges from Shah Abbas I. The British were allowed to establish a trading post in Bunda Abbas. They received the right to import their goods into Iran without paying duties, the right to receive a significant share of the income from the customs of Bunda Abbas, as well as a number of benefits for the silk trade. Encouraging the development of foreign trade, Shah Abbas I provided benefits and privileges not only to English, but also to other European merchants, especially Dutch ones. The Dutch East India Company in 1623 also received permission to establish its trading post in Bunda Abbas. Subsequently, 1645, the Dutch received the right to buy silk throughout Iran and export it from Iran without paying duties. The Dutch company in the middle of the 17th century took first place in Iran's foreign trade, pushing the British to second place. The search for allies in the fight against Turkey, as well as the interests of foreign trade, led Iran under Shah Abbas I to establish ties with a number of European countries, which, for their part, were looking for an ally in Iran in the fight against the Turks. Abbas I repeatedly sent his embassies to Russia, Holland, Spain, to the German Emperor and the Pope. In turn, embassies from Russia, England, Spain and Holland more than once arrived at the Shah's court in Iran. Shah Abbas I communicated not only with many European states, but even with such eastern possessions as Siam, whose embassy was at the Shah's court. In addition to trade privileges, other benefits were also provided to foreigners. Europeans not only had the right to freedom of religion, but the Christian clergy, and especially the Catholic monks, enjoyed the special protection of Shah Abbas I. The Iranian clergy and governors of the regions were forbidden to interfere in the affairs of foreigners. The Shah gave orders to the governors of the regions to protect the property and person of the Europeans. The privileges enjoyed by Europeans in Iran under Shah Abbas I and his successors were granted in order to attract European merchants to Iran and encourage foreign trade. These privileges to the Europeans were in no way an indicator of Iran's dependent, subordinate position in relations with European states. Iran was then a completely independent state and maintained contact with European states as an equal with equals. Thus, if, 
As a result of wars with the Turks and Uzbeks, Safavid Iran found itself isolated from the outside, and in particular, from the Muslim world from the west and northeast. Then it established regular ties with the outside world through its northern regions with Russia and through Russia, and also across the Persian Gulf with the Portuguese, Dutch and British. Along with successes in the fight against external enemies and the extensive development of foreign trade in Iran under Abbas I, handicrafts and domestic trade reached a relatively high level of development. Carpets, various fabrics, leather, ceramics and other products were produced in large quantities by Iranian artisans. Craftsmen united in medieval guilds workshops. The guilds allocated their representatives foremen of the guilds, who were in charge of the affairs of the guild and in particular, monitored the fulfillment of duties by the artisans in favor of the Shah. Many construction works in Isfahan were carried out at the expense of forced labor of artisans. In addition, artisans had to pay taxes in cash or in the products of their labor. Products of Iranian handicrafts were sold not only within the country, but were also exported abroad. In addition to private craft workshops, there were also large Shah workshops, the so-called Karkane. According to contemporaries, there were more than 30 such workshops. In each of them, there were an average of 150 workers artisans. Shah Abbas I took care of creating favorable conditions for the development of domestic trade. By his order, energetic measures were taken to ensure security on trade roads, to combat robberies and abuses, caravanserais were built, old roads were repaired and new roads were laid. Until now, in different parts of Iran, the remains of caravanserais built under Shah Abbas I have been preserved. Of the roads built under Abbas I, a large road along the southern coast of the Caspian Sea in Mazandran, about 270 kilometers long, stood out. The remains of this road can still be seen today. In general, Mazandran, whose fertile lands were the personal property of Shah Abbas I, enjoyed his great attention. The capital of the state, Isfahan, turned under Abbas I into a huge city, over 37 kilometers in circumference. The territory of Isfahan under Abbas I was three to four times larger than the territory of modern Isfahan. It is estimated that the number of inhabitants of Isfahan at that time exceeded 500,000, while at present about 200,000 people live in Isfahan. And at the end of the 16th century, there were only up to 100,000 people in Isfahan. Under Abbas I, Isfahan was radically rebuilt and turned into one of the most beautiful cities in Iran. In the center of the city, there was a large Shah Square, Maidain Shah, about 500 meters long and about 160 meters wide. Ali Kapu Palace was built on the southwestern side of the square. From the south side of the square in 1611 to 1613. The Shah Mosque was built, which is still the most beautiful mosque in Iran and one of the best monuments of Iranian architecture. On the other side of the square, the Sheikh Lutfullah Mosque was subsequently built. Behind the Ali Kapu Palace, in the garden, in front of the pool, the Chehel Sotan Fortikalamd Palace, which has survived to this day in a restored form, was erected. Stone bridges were built across the Zayande Rud River, on which Isfahan is located, the population of Isfahan still uses them today. One of the bridges, the Alaverdi Khan Bridge, about 350 m long connects the main part of Isfahan with the Armenian suburb of New Julfa. Another bridge, Kaju Field, leads to the outskirts of Sodotabod. For political reasons, Shah Abbas I followed the tradition of the first Safavid Shahs, he supported Shiites in every possible way and persecuted the Sunnis, whom he considered supporters of Turkey. And the Uzbeks. Abbas I sought to use Shiism as a means of strengthening the unity of Iran. To this end, he in every possible way contributed to the transformation of the grave of Imam Reza in Mashhad into a Shiite shrine and a place of worship and pilgrimage for all Shiites. During the reign of Shah Abbas I, Safavid Iran reached its greatest strength and power. Thanks to the successful struggle against individual recalcitrant feudal leaders, Abbas I succeeded to a certain extent in centralizing the administration of Iran. True, Abbas I still failed to completely overcome the feudal fragmentation of Iran and completely subjugate all the large, especially peripheral, feudal lords. 
The Safavid state was a feudal despotism. The Shah was an unrestricted ruler. He convened the so-called High Council, which consisted of representatives of the military nobility of nomadic tribes, bureaucracy, and clergy appointed by the Shah. But this council had only deliberative rights. The central government apparatus under Abbas I and his successors was very numerous. The maintenance of the huge Shah's court and harem was a heavy burden on the population of the country, and above all, on the peasantry. The provinces of Iran were ruled by Beglerbegs. The Shah appointed either prominent representatives of the Kaiselbash nomadic nobility, or his sons and other relatives, to the positions of Beglerbegs. Beglerbegs in the areas they controlled concentrated both administrative power and military power, the command of local troops. In order to limit the power of the Beglerbegs, the Shah surrounded them with officials who were directly subordinate to the central Shah's authority and did not depend on the Beglerbegs. Such officials were the deputy Beglerbeg Janishin, whose duty it was to monitor the actions of the Beglerbeg and report them to the capital. An official in charge of tax collection and finances in general, etc. Kalantars, mayors, who were appointed from the local nobility, or wealthy merchants, ruled the cities. Both in the regions and in the cities there were heads of the clergy, local sadders, and executioners, who were in charge of the affairs of the Shiite clergy and Sharia courts, as well as wok property. The regions of the Hossi, whose lands were the property of the Shah, were ruled not by the Beglerbegs, but by special Shah viziers. The number of Shah and state lands under Shah Abbas I and his successors increased tremendously. Treasury enormous wealth flowed into the Shah as they consisted of income from the Shah's own possessions, taxes in cash and in kind, which were imposed on agriculture, cattle breeding, crafts and trade, tribute from the non-Muslim, conquered population, Georgia, Armenia, road and customs duties, various kinds of confiscations, New Year's and other gifts and offerings. Chardin believes that in total the Shah's treasury annually received income in the amount of about 16 million livres, mostly in kind for. Ultimately, all this was exacted from the peasants and the working strata of the urban population. It was they who bore the heavy burden of maintaining the magnificent Shah's court, the troops of the Khans, the numerous clergy and officials, as well as the Beglerbegs, each of whom had his own court, modelled on the Shah's. The arbitrariness and greed of the Beglerbegs and the Shah's officials reached extraordinary proportions. No wonder Raphael Duman, who lived in Iran for about 50 years, reports that they did not ask about the rulers of Iranian regions, who govern such and such a region, but they asked. Who eats such and such a region? Under the Safavids, relations between a peasant and a landowner on the lands of the Shah, granted by the Shah for service in Tiul for a certain period most often for life, and Soyagal VI, hereditary grant with tax exemption, on VAQF, church, lands and privately owned varied depending on from circumstances. But these relations were still based on the medieval five-term formula for dividing the crop into five main factors of agricultural production, land, water, draft animals, seeds and laborious. Most often, the peasant had only half to a third or even a quarter of the harvest left. In addition, the peasants sometimes had to pay certain fees in cash and work free of charge for the landowner and the state, building roads, canals, fortresses, etc. And also had to bear a number of natural duties, to supply food and fodder to the troops, to feed passing officials, to present gifts to landowners and officials, etc. The brutal exploitation of the peasants and the working strata of the population of cities, the arbitrariness and violence on the part of the Shah and local authorities, especially in conquered countries, could not but evoke a rebuff from the people. Thanks to the strengthening of the central government, Shah Abbas I managed with extraordinary cruelty to suppress the popular uprisings that broke out during his reign, for example. The uprising of the Gilyang mob in 1592, the uprising of George Sarkadze in Georgia in 1623-1624 and etc., but immediately after his death, Shah Abbas I died at the beginning of 1629, uprisings broke out within the country with renewed vigor. The most significant of these uprisings, which are still completely unexplored, was the uprising of 1629 in Jalan, which began during the life of Shah Abbas I, local feudal lords first rebelled here. 
striving to restore the former independence of Jalan again. They proclaimed Shah one of the descendants of the former local dynasty under the name of Adil Shah. Jalan peasants and the urban population also began to join the rebels, dissatisfied with heavy taxes and oppression by the Safavids. After some time, the peasants and the urban poor began to play a very active role in the uprising, often ignoring Adil Shah himself. The rebels defeated the Shah's detachments. The Shah's vizier, who ruled Jalan, city Kalantars, many landowners and nobles, fled from Jalan. The rebels occupied Rasht and other cities of the province. In Rasht, the Shah's warehouses were seized and the stocks of raw silk collected from the peasants in the form of taxes, and taxes were divided among the poor. The same was done with the goods of foreign merchants, which were stored in the Shah's warehouses. The rebellious peasants and the urban poor did not have a definite program, and their actions were spontaneous, unorganized. This was taken advantage of by Saru Khan of Talish, who was entrusted by the central Shah's authorities with the suppression of the uprising. The detachments of the rebellious Gileans were defeated, and the uprising was crushed with extreme cruelty. After the death of Shah Abbas I, the grandson of Abbas I, Shah Sefi I, 1629-1642, ascended the Safavid throne. He had neither the energy nor the gifts of his grandfather. Experienced, talented associates of Shah Abbas, I were dismissed or even executed by him. Iran's foreign policy situation after the death of Shah Abbas I worsened. In the east, the struggle with the Uzbek Khans resumed. In the west, the Turks started a new war against Iran. In 1630, the troops of Murad IV captured Hamadan, destroyed the city, and slaughtered its population. In 1635, the Turks occupied the cities of Yerevan and Tabriz, captured by the Iranians, and in 1638, Baghdad. Under the Treaty of Constantinople, signed in 1639, Yerevan and Azerbaijan were assigned to Iran, but Arab Iraq and Baghdad remained part of the Turkish Empire. Thus, in 1639 Shah's Iran and Sultan's Turkey divided Armenia between them. Iran captured northeastern, so-called eastern, Armenia, and Turkey captured its southwestern part, usually called Western Armenia. Azerbaijan was also captured by Iran. The peoples of Transcaucasia waged a stubborn liberation struggle against the Persian and Turkish yoke. Shah Sefi, I was succeeded in 1642 by his son Abbas II, 1642-1666. During this period, Safavid Iran outwardly still flourished. Trade with European states continued on an even larger scale than during the time of Abbas I. The first place in trade with Iran at that time, as mentioned above, was occupied by the Dutch, who received the right to duty-free export of silk from Iran. Iran continued to be visited by numerous European embassies, merchants, and missionaries. Europeans who visited Iran after the death of Shah Abbas I, as well as Iranian historians, report a great development of trade and crafts, construction activities, security on trade roads and, in general, the relative prosperity of the country. In 1649, Iranian troops again captured Kaidahar, which was occupied by the Great Mughal of India, Shah Jahan, in the first year after the accession of Abbas II to the throne. Shah Jahan's attempts in 1651, 1652, and 1654 to capture Kandahar again were successfully repulsed by the troops of Abbas II. The uprising in Georgia against the vassal of the Iranian Shah Rustam Khan, led by Tamas Khan, was also suppressed and Tamas had to flee to Russia. But already under Shah Soliman, 1666-1694, there were clear signs of the weakening of the Safavid state, its economic and political decline. The activity of the Uzbek Khans in the east no longer met with serious resistance. The Dutch captured the island of Keshem in the Persian Gulf, and this also did not cause a rebuff from Iran. At the end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century, both external and internal trade began to decline, and the revenues of the treasury fell. During the first six to seven years of the reign of Shah Suleiman, income from the customs of Bunda Abbas and the port of Kong, 
near the port of Linge, amounted to only 400 to 500,000 livres. While under his father they reached 1,000 100,000 livres. In an attempt to attract European merchants to Iran, and French in particular, Shah Sultan Hossein in 1708 and 1715 concluded trade agreements with France, which provided French merchants and subjects with exceptionally broad rights and privileges. They were completely exempted from customs inspection, from the payment of any duties and taxes. Iranian officials were responsible for the safety of their property, the Iranians had to provide them with premises free of charge, etc. French consuls were given the right to resolve disputes between the French in Iran and to be present at the resolution of disputes between the French and local residents. Thus, these treaties established capitulation rights for the French in Iran. True, these capitulations were not yet the result of France's economic and political pressure on Iran or Iran's dependence on it. They were provided by the Shah in order to attract French merchants to Iran in opposition to the Dutch East India Company, which claimed a monopoly, and to promote the growth of foreign trade. However, the conclusion of these treaties and the provision of wide benefits to the French did not lead to an increase in Iran's trade with France. By the end of the 17th century, the economic and political decline of the Safavid state was already quite obvious. Some European and Iranian historians and travelers are trying to explain the decline of the Safavid state by corruption and decay of the Shah's court, the mediocrity of the last Safavid Shahs. The growing influence of eunuchs and clergy, palace intrigues, the struggle of various groups of feudal nobility, and similar circumstances. Of course, all these phenomena took place and to a certain extent aggravated the situation and weakened the Safavid state but they were rather outward manifestations of the decline of Safavid Iran than its root causes. As an important reason that undermined the economic and political position of Iran by the end of the 18th century. They usually point to a change in trade routes as a result of the development of the sea route from Europe to India around Africa. This circumstance indeed had a very unfavorable effect on Iran. The established sea route from Europe to India and other countries of the East undermined the importance of the land route through Iran. Transit caravan trade has declined sharply. This led to a reduction in the income of the Shah's treasury, to a gradual decline in the welfare of Iranian cities, and to a deterioration in the economic situation of the country. But besides these reasons that undermined the well-being of Iran, there were others, even deeper and more serious. One of the most important factors that caused the decay and decline of the Safavid state was the excessive, the further, the more growing. Feudal exploitation of the peasantry and the working population of cities, which not only was not accompanied by an increase in productive forces, but also led to the undermining of agriculture and handicrafts. The peasant economy was ruined and impoverished. At the same time, in Iran, unlike Europe, the large-scale economy of the feudal lords almost did not develop, which could replace the ruined peasant economy. The Shah's authorities, by increasing taxes, tried to prevent a drop in income, which further undermined agriculture, handicrafts and trade. Cruel arbitrariness, violence and robberies in the conquered regions, which increased more and more under the last Safavids, provoked a rebuff from the conquered peoples. Their struggle for their liberation from the rule of the Safavids weakened the Safavid state. The effect of these factors, which undermined the strength of the Safavid state, was especially pronounced during the reign of the last Safavid Shah, Sultan Hossein, 1694-1722. Taxes under this Shah were increased by the 2nd of March times. Between the various groups of the feudal nobility, and primarily between the eunuchs and the clergy, who also seized large land holdings, on the one hand and the secular feudal lords, on the other. There was a fierce struggle. The excessive influence of the fanatical Shiite clergy on state affairs had a very unfavorable effect on the cultural life of the country. If during the reign of the Safavids court historiography received a fairly wide development, then Iranian literature and poetry in general, although they were represented by many names of poets and writers, did not give anything new and original. As a rule, the absence of new, lively thoughts was covered up by extreme pomposity and flamboyance of style. 
The fanaticism and obscurantism of the all-powerful clergy fettered the development of literature, poetry, and philosophy. This applies not only to the period of decline of the Safavids, but, perhaps, to the entire Safavid period as a whole. Thoughts that did not correspond to Shiite religious dogmas could be expressed without the risk of being accused of disbelief, only symbolically. In allegories and in a form that was difficult to understand. That is exactly what one of the most interesting thinkers of Iran, Mullah Sadr of Shiraz, died in 1640 or 1641, did. In his main work, written in Arabic, Alas Far Laba, four books, he came to conclusions that contradicted both religious dogmas and the existing socio political system. His views had a great influence on the further development of philosophical thought in Iran. In particular, the influence of the philosophy of Mullah Sadr strongly affected the teachings of early Babis, which became the ideology of the largest Babid movement in the 19th century, 1848 to 1852. But by the 18th century, due to the economic and political decline of the country, the development of philosophy, as well as other aspects of the cultural life of Iran, freezes. By the beginning of the 18th century, the contradictions between peasants and feudal lords, as well as between the conquered peoples and the ruling Safavid elite, became extremely aggravated. The position of the ruling Safavid elite was also greatly weakened by the fact that within it there was a fierce struggle between the clergy, and secular feudal lords and a struggle between various feudal groups. All this led to the fact that at the beginning of the 18th century, outbreaks of popular discontent and uprisings systematically occurred in many interior regions of Iran. The uprisings of the conquered peoples on the outskirts of the Safavid Empire were especially widespread. At the same time, some uprisings of the conquered peoples took place under the ideological banner of protecting the persecuted Sunnism and the struggle against Shiism. A strong tribe of Sunni Afghans, the Gilzais, who lived in the Kandahar region, after the death of Abbas I, repeatedly raised uprisings against the Safavid rulers. At the beginning of the 18th century, the head of the Gilzai tribe was the energetic Kandahar Kalanta Mirwais, popular among the Afghans. The cunning Mirwais managed to use the struggle of the cliques at the Shah's court. With bribes and intrigues, he managed to restore Shah Nawaz Khan against the Shah's governor of the Kandahar region and win over to his side an influential court group headed by the Shah's first vizier. In 1709, the Gilzais, under the leadership of Mirwais, raised an uprising against the Safavids. Shah Nawaz Khan and almost his entire detachment were exterminated by the Afghans. Mirwais became the de facto independent ruler of Kandahar. After the death of Mirwais, in 1715, his brother Mir Abdullah became his successor. He tried to reconcile with the Shah, but in 1717 he was killed by the Gilzais as a traitor. The young, enterprising and courageous Mir Mahmud, the son of Mirwais, stood at the head of the Gilzai tribe. At the same time, Lesgin uprisings, 1711-1719, took place in the Caucasus, which captured Shemaka and other cities of Transcaucasia. In the south, the Arabs from Mosqat in 1717 captured the Bahrain and other islands of the Persian Gulf and raided the Iranian coast of the Persian Gulf. In the region of Herat in 1716, another Afghan Sunni tribe, the Abdali, revolted, which, united with the Uzbeks, began to raid Khorasan. In 1719, the Abdalis defeated the troops of the Shah of Iran sent against them and thus established their independence. At the same time, the Kurds rebelled in northwestern Iran. Detachments of Kurds reached almost to the very walls of Isfahan. Thus, at the beginning of the 18th century, the Safavid state experienced a severe crisis.